All right, so thank you everyone. Uh, very happy to be here today uh, virtually and to tell you a little bit about this project that we've been working, all, working on called MadBench. In contrast to some of the earlier presentations you saw, this is not really about a specific machine learning algorithm uh, or a specific problem, but rather about how do we actually compare machine learning algorithms? How do we measure progress over time as we invent more and more machine learning algorithms? So it's more of a meta, meta study than a particular study itself. Um, so my name is Anubhav Jain. I'm a staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I'm also deputy director of the materials project, which I think was mentioned in previous talks. Um, so in terms of the outline for the talk that I am giving today, um, in, in the spirit of some of the, the, the overall workshop goals, I wanted to give a quick introduction to the materials project to the people that uh, maybe are unfamiliar with this resource. And I also wanted to talk about um, a new platform that we have in materials project called MP Contribs. And this is a way for you to all, um, submit your own data sets to materials project and have it be visible on the materials project website. So this also uh, relates to all the fair principles of making your data findable and accessible, et cetera. Um, finally, the main topic of this, this presentation is about how we can benchmark different machine learning algorithms using consistent data sets and using consistent protocols. And so that is the MatBench project that I'll be talking more in detail about. So let me begin with the materials project and just give a quick introduction. You know, I think um, most people are probably familiar with the materials project, but just in case, let me um, give a little bit of an overview. So the core of the materials project is really a free database of calculated materials properties and crystal structures. So the URL is materialsproject.org. And currently it has data on about 150,000 different materials. This includes things like electronic structure, photon and thermal properties, uh, and other properties as well, such as magnetic, ferroelectric, dielectric properties, et cetera. Uh, as Jean-Marco mentioned earlier in the, the overview of the session, we don't have every property for every compound. And typically as the properties become more expensive to compute, the fewer compounds we have that on. But we are working continually on trying to um, um, fill in the database and have, have full data on all the compounds. There's actually also a button on materials project where you can request that certain properties be calculated. So for example, the elastic tensors. And so if there are certain materials that you are particularly interested in, there's a button that you can click and that will pr automatically prioritize that compound to be uh, calculated versus some of the other compounds. Um, so most of the materials project is really calculated data. So it's been powered by hundreds of millions of CPU hours uh, in these density functional theory calculations. Uh, I say most because as I'll talk about later in the talk, there's also a contribution section where people have contributed experimental data as well. So in materials project, the core data set keeps growing with time. So this is not a static resource. Um, we only made this plot up until the year 2018, but over time we've been uh, increasing the number of crystal structures, but actually for a while now, we haven't been increasing the number of compounds so much, but what we have been doing is changing the number of properties or computing more properties per compound. So adding band structures, adding elastic tensors, recently adding more magnetic properties, uh, more paid electric properties, dielectric properties, et cetera. Um, so the, both the number of compounds as well as the number of properties per compound is uh, increasing with time. In addition to just the raw data sets, the materials project also has what we refer to as apps. Uh, there are many apps, as you can see on the left portion of the slide. And one of the things that these apps do is it actually helps you make useful comparisons and plots from the data set. So for example, on the type right here, you see a phase diagram or a phase stability diagram chart, uh, which really shows you what are the stable phases and what are the phase equilibria for a particular chemical space. You can make these for four elements. You can project them to get like an open element. And so there's a lot of useful functionality that you can do without having to write the code yourself. Um, also, I should point out that as has was brought up before, a lot of these analyses require some kind of post-processing analysis where we are correcting energies or we're adding reference energies, et cetera. And so by using these online apps, you can kind of avoid some of that process and have it all done for you. Um, so in addition to the data itself, the materials project has many codes that it makes available open source, uh, either, either with a Berkeley license or an MIT license. Uh, those are both very open licenses. They don't require you to also redistribute derivative packages in a certain way. They're commercial friendly, so companies can use them, et cetera. Um, so there are many packages like Fireworks, PyMetrin, Custodian Atomate, and Crystal Toolkit. Uh, one comment that I'll make about this is that 
Materials Project takes more of a philosophy of having many separate packages versus one overall Materials Project package. And you know, in some ways, this makes it so that you have to install lots of codes and not just one code. Uh, but the advantage to this is that there are people that like to use some of these packages, but not others. So to take one example, um, you know, PyMetGen is the code that, given a crystal structure, will generate input and output files and parse the output files, et cetera. Um, and Fireworks is the code that will actually run calculations on supercomputing centers, regardless of what type of calculation it is. And we haven't merged these two uh, into one package. Uh, they're, they're, they're separate packages. And so there's some people that use Fireworks, for example, with ASE, Atomic Simulation Environment, instead of PyMatGen. And there's some people that use PyMatGen but never use all the automatic features of Fireworks. They might use their own automated scripts or things like that to submit to the computer. So we have many separate packages that people can use. Um, so I'll talk just very quickly about two of these. Um, one of them is called Atomate, and this is our calculation workflows. This is what Materials Project uses internally to run all of the calculations that it uses for its data sets. Uh, and really what Atomate is, is the way to um, generate calculation workflow. So you give it a crystal structure, you might give it a few other parameters, like what kinds of functionals you want to use or what kind of settings you want to use for a calculation. Uh, and then Atomate will do all the work of transforming this into a workflow. Uh, so a specific object that tells you what calculations to do and how to connect the outputs of one to the inputs of the other. And then we'll also take care of running that on the supercomputer, parsing the results into a database and uh, helping you plot the results. Um, so these now, uh, we have workflows now for many, many Many different uh, types of workflows. Right now, Atomate is really VASP centric, I would say, but we've been working with John Marco's group to actually get Abinet uh, released in the future as well. So that way you could do everything fully open source without having to buy uh, any sort of license whatsoever. Um, so you know, we were working more on Atomate. We're actually working on something called Atomate 2, which is an even user friendlier way of doing some of these things. Uh, but we're happy to answer more questions about that if you have them. Uh, more relevant to this session, another package that Materials Project offers is called MapMiner. And MapMiner is really a way to generate feature sets for machine learning. It doesn't do the full machine learning process itself, so it doesn't do the machine learning model. It really is a way to just start with a composition or a crystal structure or a site in a crystal uh, and generate different types of features for that. So right now, there are more than 60 featureizer classes. So there's many, many different types of feature sets that you can do. Uh, and each of those feature sets can generate maybe tens or hundreds of features. So you really can generate thousands of potential descriptors using the MapMiner package. Um, it, the types of features that you would want to generate really depends on what type of data that you have. So for example, in the yellow over here is a composition class. And this just given any chemical formula can generate different types of features like what are electronegativity differences, uh, like a one hot encoding of the element fraction, uh, uh, um, a featureizer related to the Medema model for alloy energies. Uh, so there's lots of different types of feature sets that you can get just with the composition. Uh, if you have a site in a structure, so for example, in a previous uh, talk in the session, we were talking about adsorbates on a surface. And if you want to know, for example, geometrical properties of the adsorbate, like uh, you know how many bonds does it have, what angles are the bonds, uh, what sorts of coordinations are the bonds of this adsorbate on this thing, and, and you want to describe that numerically, you can use some of these site features that will take any site in the crystal structure and tell you things like what's the coordination environment, what's the shape, things like that. Uh, there are also overall crystal structure features. Uh, so for example, we have the Ewald energy, which will tell you what is the electrostatic energy of a, of a structure that has charges assigned to it, for example. Uh, so again, there are many different ingredients of features that you can use, and uh, you can use these features in many different types of downstream machine learning packages, uh, as I'll show a little bit later as well. So the materials project is used heavily by the research community. Um, at this point, we now have 180,000 registered users. Uh, and so this seems to be increasing exponentially. It obviously can't keep uh, increasing exponentially. So at some point we will see uh, you know, where it kind of levels out. But over the last year, there's been many, many new users um, and um, yeah, lots of data being downloaded through the materials project from all over the world. All right, so let me... Yeah, and then finally, I'll just say that a large fraction of the Materials Project users are actually from industry. So uh, about 10% of our users are industry users, uh, about 36% are academia, and almost half of our users are actually students as well. So this seems to be um, a resource that, that many different people can use uh, all the way from the student level to the real like industrial level. 
Okay, so with that, let me end the, um, the introduction to materials project and tell you about something we've been working on for the past few years called MP Contribs. And this is a way to take your own data sets and disseminate them through the materials project. So what we wanted to do was to actually leverage the materials project to help build a, a larger community of materials researchers. Um, so for example, the materials project has high visibility in the sense that if you go to Google and you search for, you know, molybdenum diselenide, um, actually, the, you know, the first result is from PubChem. The second one is um, really the, the original paper, I guess, of the, the crystal structure. But then the third link is actually the materials project uh, details page for the molybdenum um, diselenide. So what that means is that when people are searching for various chemical compounds in Google, um, they actually see materials project results relatively high up, uh, and they're likely to, to see that data set page that comes up for, for a particular chemical uh, composition. So obviously there's a lot of data on molybdenum disolenide and all these other compounds that aren't computed by materials project uh, that are either in the literature or things that people are measuring in the lab, et cetera. So we really want to use this platform as a way to help get that data out to the people that are clicking this link in, in Google. So that's where MP Contrabs comes in. MP Contrabs is a way to allow the research community to contribute their own data sets to materials project. Um, the way that it works is that Currently on the left is what materials project looks like. There's a materials details page and it has all our calculated information about a material. Uh, on the right side is MP Contribs. And MP Contribs is um, a platform that looks a lot like other data contribution platforms, where there's different data sets that are contributed by different research groups. Uh, and then there's the actual raw data, if you click one of these data sets, as well as you know, some, some plots and things and visualizations of the data sets. Uh, but then on, what MP Contribs does also is it, it takes the data from these data sets and it displays them on the materials project details page on the appropriate material. So that when people are actually searching through all these compounds like aluminum oxide, and they're looking for other information, they also are looking through, in a sense, all of these other data sets that have been contributed by the community. And there could be some data in here that is actually linked on the materials project page. So, you know, the way that we envision this going is that, you know, Google uh, links to the materials project. Uh, the materials project tells you all the data that we have, but then in one section of the materials project called user contributions, it actually goes to external data that has been contributed by the user community. Uh, in this case by DTU, this is Ivano Castelli, uh, Francesco is one of John Marco's uh, old students. Uh, so, uh, and, and so this will actually tell you all the things that, that not only we compute, but other people have contributed as well. And then you can actually get to the full data sets if you're interested in not just this materials information, but all the other information as well, uh, as well as links to the original papers as well. So uh, let me just end that section by saying that MP Contribs is open for contributions. So if you have a data set that you think would link well with the materials project that you'd like to disseminate via the materials project, uh, definitely get in touch or go to mpcontrips.org uh, and then we will help you with that process. Um, one thing that I will say is that MP Contrips is really designed for smaller data sets, so megabytes to gigabytes. Uh, if you have you know, very large output files, you know, uh, charge, charge density files or wave density files, things like that, um, that's not really the type of data that, that MP Contrips is storing. Um, so for that, we would, we would suggest something like Nomad or some of the other repos for more general data uh, deposition uh, that can really handle very, very large data sets. What MP Contrips is really intended to do is to say that, hey, I have a whole list of band gaps for a hundred compounds or something, and I would like those band gaps to show up on materials project. That's a very small data set and that can easily go on materials project. Um, the other real thing about materials project is that it should really link to the materials project compositions in order for it to be useful. So if you had a data set on lots of organic compounds, uh, we don't really have organic compounds on materials project. So it's unlikely that someone would get from materials project to your data set if you, if you didn't have you know, some links to materials project compositions. So with those two caveats, you know, um, if there's anything that, that really fits here, we'd really be happy to, to help you disseminate that. Okay, so let me move on to the final topic of this talk, which is uh, benchmarking machine learning methods using the MatBench protocol. 
So Materials Project is now involved in an effort to look at different machine learning algorithms and try and understand better um, how much improvement are we making as we invent more and more you know, modifications to, to the old algorithms. Uh, and also what are, which algorithms seem to work better for which types of problems. And you know, these days there are so many different machine learning algorithms coming out in the literature. Um, every single one of them obviously <laughs> reports that they are doing the best on all the different problems that they test uh, for the most part. And so it becomes really, really difficult to decide if you are if you want to use a machine learning model, for example, which one of these should I use? Um, you know, am I using the right one? Is there some other one that I should be using, et cetera? So we wanted to really help organize some of this information. And one of the things that we see in the literature today is that it can be very difficult to compare performance that it's reported in papers from different machine learning models. So for example, if you have three different machine learning models on the top, they're often tested on different data sets. So uh, one of them might be tested on a data set that's formation energies and doesn't involve the crystal structures, only the, the chemical compositions and it has 4,000 uh, samples. Um, and then the second model might be tested on a different database that has structures available and has many more samples and you know has some data filters applied to make sure that it's only stable compounds and no crazy structures, et cetera. And model three might just take everything and you know it's very difficult uh, or, or unspecified what's happening. And then they also report the errors in different ways. So one model might use an RMSC error, one might use a mean absolute error, another one might use some kind of a validation loss. So it's very difficult to know um, which of these models is, is really performing better and um, how do you do like an apples to apples comparison. So in our opinion, what's needed is something like an ImageNet for material science. I think many of you are probably familiar with what ImageNet is, uh, but really ImageNet is a data set that uh, started now over 10 years ago. And um, according to this article, it was originally published as a research poster in the corner of a Miami Beach conference center. But ImageNet has become really the biggest and most important uh, image analysis machine learning data set. And there's always competitions now to see how much better we can do uh, how, in, in terms of getting a good uh, classification performance on ImageNet. So this is the set of images that were hand labeled to say that, okay, this is an image of a cat, this is an image of a dog, this is an image of a train, et cetera. And then machine learning algorithms would compete to see, could they automatically classify these images uh, as well as a human? Uh, and ImageNet was largely credited with uh, really transforming the field of, of machine vision because it gave people a unified uh, data set to actually compete on and make improvements on. So if you were to actually plot, so on the left is the plot of uh, over time from the year 2010 to the year 2017, how well did the various machine learning algorithms do on this sort of image analysis problem? Again, classifying images into cats or trains or whatever. Um, so in the first year, actually, um, you know, no algorithm did better than you know 25% wrong. Uh, and there was a lot of scatter between the different algorithms that existed at the time, the different machine learning algorithms. Um, but actually what happened over time is that people got better and better at using this data set and figuring out what are, what are, what are the best ways to actually understand images. Uh, and you can see that over time, two things happen. First of all, um, the, the best models actually get better and better to the point where it's almost as good as a human these days. So the, the problem is essentially solved. Uh, and then you also see that the scatter between the models becomes very, very narrow, which means that every model actually does quite well. Uh, and there's nothing that does bad. In fact, the, the one worst model in the year 2017 is like much better than the best model in 2010. Um, and so what's really nice about these sorts of data sets is that they decouple the data generation from the algorithm development, which means that all these groups submitting to ImageNet didn't have to spend the effort taking 100,000 images and labeling them by hand. Uh, they just started with the data set and they could focus on the machine learning algorithm. Uh, and in contrast, a lot of times what happens with material science, uh, less so with some of these materials databases, but what happens is that in order to do the machine learning, you first have to collect the data and that data collection and cleaning process, et cetera, can be the thing that takes up 90% you know, of your time and then you don't have a lot of time to innovate on the machine learning algorithm. Okay, so what we wanted to do was to have a benchmark like ImageNet for material science, which we called MatBench. And to us, the three ingredients were having standardized data sets that everybody always runs the algorithms on the same data sets. Um, standardized test splits, so even within the same data set to make sure that you're training and testing on the same, same part of the data. 
Uh, and then finally, an online leaderboard that has, you know, what's the best performing algorithm and also uh, details on how to reproduce the data yourself. So the online leaderboard not only makes sure that the, the results are, are reproducible, but also helps kind of, you know, in, incentivize people to try and get on the leaderboard and say, okay, ours is the best for these tasks, et cetera. So currently, MatBench includes 13 different machine learning tasks. And this is different than something like ImageNet or some of the other standardized machine learning test sets, like you know, the Glue test set or Stanford question and answer data set. And that it's not just one data set and one test. There's actually 13 different tasks. And one of the reasons that we ended up with more than one um, is because there's a lot of diversity in the types of problems that material scientists face. Um, on one hand, you have uh, problems that are very small in terms of the data that's available. And on the other hand, you have uh, data sets that are very large and that the types of machine learning algorithms that are appropriate might depend on whether you have a small or a large data set. So in MatBench, for example, we have both small and large data sets. Uh, we also wanna have different types of materials properties that, that are computed. Uh, and so we, we end up having many different data sets that we've compiled from the various part, parts of the literature as well as from the materials project database. Um, so as I mentioned previously, there's a lot of variety to the problem. So we tried to pick of the 13 uh, different types of, of uh, applications. So this includes stability, information energies, electronic properties like band gap and uh, dielectric tensors, uh, mechanical properties like elastic moduli as well as optical and thermal properties. Uh, we, we span the range of samples. So everywhere down from a few hundred samples to over a hundred thousand samples. Uh, to again see whether certain techniques work better for different sample sizes. Um, there are also um, different types of inputs. So some machine learning algorithms only work if you have the crystal structure. Uh, other machine learning algorithms don't use the crystal structure information at all and only work with the chemical composition. And so we wanted to have some problems that included the crystal structure information and some that you don't have the crystal structure and you only have the composition. And then finally, we had both regression and classification tasks. Uh, the other thing with these data sets is that we try to pre-clean them uh, because a lot of times a difference in reporting is depending on how you clean the data beforehand and what data you get rid of. Uh, and so we document all the cleaning procedures for these data sets so that you don't have to invent your own cleaning protocol and then end up with different scores that way. Um, and it also includes both experimental and computed properties. So it's not all just calculated data, it also includes experimental data. So if you're interested in the data sets themselves, we actually uh, used MP Contribs ourselves to contribute these data sets to Materials Project. Um, so if you go to ml.materialsproject.org, you will see the MP Contribs um, um, site for, for these data sets, where you can actually see all the raw data uh, as well as be able to download them as JSON or CSV, et cetera. Okay, so now we have standardized data sets. Uh, the next thing we wanted to do was to just standardize the way that we define the training and the test set and have, have standardized splits. And we did something a little bit different here. So I just wanna quickly explain what that is. Um, so the most commonly used test split procedure that, that you're all aware of uh, is that you have uh, in blue here, some kind of a training set that, that the model has access to for training. And then you have some kind of a holdout set, a test set, which the model cannot use to train, but then is used to evaluate how good the model is. And then typically what would happen is that in the training data, uh, you would internally split that into a training and a validation set. You would use that to help do your model selection and your model hyperparameter optimization. And then when you're finally all done, you run it once on the test set. Uh, you, and then you, know, you don't go back and you know, rerun everything because you already used the test set, so it's kind of burned. So that's a typical procedure. Um, what we do is a little bit different, which is we basically repeat this process multiple times because if you just have one test set, so going back to the previous slide, um, if you just have one test set, if this test set just happens to be a type of thing uh, that, that your model does really good at, or you know, has certain weird characteristics, then you could end up with you know, strange algorithms being the ones that, that, that perform the best. So ideally, you wanna have every data point have some chance to be part of the test set so that every data point is used for the evaluation. So what we use is something called nested cross-validation. Uh, and so the first part of nested cross-validation is just like before, where you have a test set that's hold out and then you have a training set and then you again use the training set to update your model and then you, you evaluate it on your test set. 
But then you repeat that process multiple times with different parts of the data being your test set. Uh, and so your training data set changes in this next part so that you have to retrain your model using the new training data, and then you test it on the new test data. And you repeat this process, let's say five times so that every single um, data point has had one opportunity to be part of a test set. You take the five different scores in this case, and then you average them together to get one score. Um, so basically, it's a lot like the typical procedure, except now you don't have so this thing where you know one portion of the test set might be really well optimized for. Uh, you have to go through and use every single data point as your test set as well. Um, so there are some been some research that show that you know this kind of nested cross validation procedure is you know better at, at getting an estimate of your true error than just having one test set. So that's what we use in, in that bench. Okay, so we have standard data sets. We have a standard way to do the test splits with the nested cross validation. Um, the last part we've been working on is this online leaderboard that helps you get reproducible results. So right now, um, there's a site that we, we put up called matbench.materialsproject.org. And this is really an online leaderboard of uh, the different tasks that we've set up and what are the algorithms and how are they been performing on them. Um, so here again, those 13 tasks that I introduced before with the different sample set sizes going from small to large. And then this algorithm here is of the current machine learning algorithms that we've tested so far with, with MatBench, which one has been performing the best? And then what is the mean absolute error or the ROC AUC for classification um, for that particular model? Uh, here's a plot of the same thing. Uh, so the different tasks uh, going from left to right. And then you kind of see these different uh, algorithms and, and how they're performing. Um, you'll see the different characteristics, by the way, which I'll, I'll point out again later. But for example, CGCNN is a graph neural network. And you'll see that in the beginning, so these data sets on the left have low data points. And you can see that CrabNet has a relatively, sorry, CGCNN has relatively high errors up here. But then down here, where you have very large data sets, these are about 100,000 points or so, it really does much, much better than some of the other algorithms. Um, and so you see these sorts of trends as you go through the data uh, of which algorithms are working better on which problems. So in addition to the, the raw scores uh, on, on that bench and just showing you what's doing the best on each task, um, there's actually a, a lot more information that you can get on every single model that's been tested. So for example, you can get sample by sample predictions, which means that for every single data point that was used in the test set, so every single data point, uh, you can see exactly what was the number produced by each model. And that's actually useful because if you actually, if you wanna try to run the models yourself, sometimes you wanna know like, am I using the same hyperparameters, the same version of the code? Am I getting the same results that, that was previously gotten for these models? Uh, and having these sample by sample predictions will, um, will help you verify that you, when you run the model, you're getting the same results as everybody else. Uh, similarly, there's IPython notebooks uh, for every model that shows you how do I actually run the model? Like what, how was the model run in order for me to get these results so that you can run the same code yourself uh, and the Python codes uh, scripts as well as the IPython ones. Um, and so uh, also for every single uh, model, we have a lot of metadata. So some description of the, of the model, as well as like, you know, what were the parameters used, et cetera, to, to run this model. So it really helps not only tell you what the best, you know, models are, but also helps you run them and make sure that you're running them in the same way as other people. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned previously, you can compare the algorithms uh, overall, uh, or you can look within each task. So this is, a, I think, a dielectric uh, function prediction task. And you can see, okay, these are the different algorithms on the x-axis. Uh, and you can see, you know, which ones are doing better, which ones are doing worse. In this case, uh, you know, Auto Map Miner Express seems to be doing well along with CrabNet. Uh, the dummy model is just a very simple model where you take the average of the data set and see how well that does. Um, and so, yeah, you, you can kind of dig into each of these and get more and more information about the different algorithms. Okay, so, so far, what have we done with MapBench? Uh, we've looked at a few different models and we are hoping to get more and more of these machine learning models evaluated with MapBench over time. Um, the first one is a very traditional model, which is basically using a code called Magpie to generate the features. These are very conventional features, like what's the average electronegativity and standard, standard deviation of electronegativity of the elements in your compound. And then just using a random forest model to take those descriptors and either make a prediction, like a regression or a classification prediction. Um, 
Then in addition to that very traditional model, we also have uh, an auto ML model uh, called AutoMap Miner. And this is a lot like the traditional model, but just kind of amped up a little bit. So uh, in addition to the MagPy features, AutoMap Miner uses pretty much the entire library of descriptors that's available in the MapMiner package. So I mentioned there's like thousands of descriptors that you can generate. So it actually does generate many, many, many descriptors automatically um, for a given problem, given the data set. And then it has automatic um, uh, routines to try and clean up the features and reduce the number of features down so that you don't have correlated features and things. Uh, and then, so once you have a, a list of reduced features, it uses AutoML to actually try and figure out what is the best machine learning model for that particular problem. So AutoML has a list of potential models that it can try. So it might try, you know, you know, kernel ridge regression. It might try random forest, et cetera. It'll try different hyperparameters for all the different models. And it uses genetic algorithms to kind of search through the space of different machine learning models and try to pick the best one. Um, so automat miner is also available uh, open source uh, along with the miner package. So this is something that given the data set will automatically train and, and give you a model. Um, in addition to these more traditional paradigms, uh, there's been a lot of work in the last couple of years about deep neural networks and also showing very, very good performance compared to the traditional um, things. So there is one called CrabNet that works just based on a composition uh, and will actually figure out, you know, what are good interactions between elements and things. Uh, so for example, if you have aluminum oxide, what's the interaction between aluminum and oxygen that helps you um, uh, get to a particular property? Uh, so there's one called CrabNet. There's one from John Marco's group actually called ModNet, which is actually very similar in spirit to AutoMap Miner, but instead of using these more traditional ways of doing things, it actually uses uh, neural networks to do some of the feature selection as well as some of the prediction as well. Uh, and then there's also crystal graph neural networks, which many of you are probably familiar with, the original ones as well as modifications like VegNet. Um, so these are all the types of algorithms that we've been uh, investigating. Um, some of these are already in MatBench. So for example, um, you know, there's Random Forest as well as the Automat Miners already in MatBench. CrabNet was recently added to MatBench. Uh, ModNet has a pull request in review. So they've, they've done the work needed to put it into MatBench and we're just you know, going over some minor things and that should be there very soon and you'll sh you should see it on the leaderboard. Um, and then finally, Crystal Graph Neural Network, CGCNN is already in MatBench. Magnet, we did a previous test for, um, but then some of the data got corrupted or something. So now we're just trying to clean that up and get that also in that bench as well. So, you know, so far what we're seeing, um, I kind of hinted at this earlier, is that some of the graph neural networks work very well for large data sets, uh, whereas some of the more conventional methods seem to work better for smaller data sets. And so um, what we're seeing here is uh, the data set size on the x-axis. And then this is a normalized error on the y-axis. It's a, a way of normalizing the errors that the different problems, which have different units and all that stuff, uh, can, can all be on a consistent scale. And so what we see here is that on the data sets that have, let's say, 600 data points, um, in the blue is the auto map miner, which is a more conventional uh, machine learning approach, seems to be doing the lowest error. And things like CGCNN and MegNet, uh, which are more of the deep learning models, uh, they don't have enough data to really train well, and so they end up with a much larger error. Um, but as you actually get to a larger data set size, uh, what you see is that the slope of some of these um, these crystal graph neural networks like MegNet or CGCNN, they have a very sharp slope, which means that they rapidly get better with increased data. Uh, whereas some of the more traditional models like Random Forest or AutoMet Miner in orange or, or, or blue, uh, they have a more shallow slope so that they don't really get as better as you add more data points as some of the deep learning methods. So what happens is that, you know, around 10,000 data points or so, you have this like crossover between, you know, it's better to use maybe traditional on the left side, but it's better to use deep learning on the right side. And certainly by the time you get to like 100,000 um, uh, data points, uh, 10,000 or 100,000 data points, um, that, that that's when you really see the advantage of the deep learning methods. Now, I will say that um, new methods are coming out all the time, and we might see methods that, that really do well across the, the spectrum. Uh, for example, the ModNet, um, platform that I that I introduced earlier um, that also seems to do bet that, that that one seems to do good across the entire range and so as we see more and more of these models come out we're, we're going to see progress on on this sort of uh, slope so if you want to use MapBench and you have a machine learning algorithm and you want it to show up on the leaderboard you want it to show up on these plots and everything what do you have to do 
Um, it's actually not probably not as difficult as you think it is. Um, you can really run the, the everything in about 10 lines of code. So you have to install the map bench Python package, which you just can do in the one line. Uh, and then here's the code that you need to run in order to have all the, the things that you need in order to submit your, your model results to us. Um, so you import the map benchmark package and then you basically initialize it. And the auto load is false because if you turn it to true, it will actually load all the data sets uh, at once and it's going to just take a long time to load all the data sets. Uh, so this will just initialize it without loading the data sets. Then this will iterate through every single one of those 13 data sets that I mentioned and load that particular data set up. And then each of these folds is one of the, the nested cross validation um, um, tests. And then what you do is you actually get the training and the validation. Uh, you get the training data basically for every single um, for every single data set. Uh, and then you, what you have to do is you have to implement the method that will actually, um, given the training data, initialize your model, all the hyperparameters and all that stuff, uh, which you probably already have if you have a machine learning model. Uh, then you get the test data and then your model has to be able to make specific predictions for the test data. Again, you probably already have that. Um, and then what you basically do is to just record what the list of predictions is for that fold. So as long as you can, you have a model that can, you know, given a training data set can initialize the model and giving a testing data set can make a list of predictions. Uh, this task that record will automatically generate all the reports needed that's needed for Matt Miner, uh, sorry, for Matt Bench to, to do everything. So once you've recorded the results of all of your predictions, you can just export that to a file. Uh, and that file is what's needed in order for us to put it into the Matt Bench protocol. So then you just submit that file along with your model um, uh, metadata to a, a GitHub pull request, and then we'll review the pull request and make sure it looks all in order. And then once that's done, we can put it on the, the Matt Bench website. Okay, so those are the three ingredients uh, that we've been working on for the map bench benchmark. Um, so in terms of overall and upcoming goals, um, so we've introduced methods that will allow research to evaluate uh, machine learning models on a standard benchmark. So it's, we're not all evaluating things on different benchmarks. Um, we also um, provide metadata and code examples that allow others to reproduce those models and use those models maybe a bit more easily because there are code examples of how to do it. There's specific results that you should get when you make uh, predictions on certain data sets uh, and then you can verify that you're getting the same results. Um, MapBench can also be a place where you discover new machine learning models so you can look through and say, okay, for the type of application that I have or for the type of data set size that I have, these seem to be the best models today that I have that, that, that are better available in the community and those are the ones that I want to try. Um, and in the future, we do want to expand the type of tasks. So if you have suggestions for types of tasks that are missing in MapBench, we'd be open to you know, adding more tasks, uh, performing more meta-analyses on what types of algorithms work better for certain problems. And we'd also really like to just plot progress on these tasks over time. So just like you saw in ImageNet where you know, in the year 2000 and uh, whatever, 2010, um, the, the performance wasn't that good and it was very scattered. Uh, and then over the course of 10 years or so, um, things got very, very good and you saw the narrowing of the uh, performance of different uh, algorithms. Uh, we'd like to kind of see, does that also play out in the material science space? How much better do we get than five years ago, et cetera? So just uh, to, to conclude, um, if you're unfamiliar with the materials project, it's a free resource that provides data and tools to help you perform R&D of new materials. Um, if you are interested in contributing your own data to materials project and making more of a unified community, uh, we encourage you to look at the MP Contrips platform. Uh, and then finally, if you are developing machine learning models or you're interested in testing different machine learning models, we encourage you to give Matt Bench a try. Uh, and we look forward to seeing uh, your algorithm uh, on the leaderboard as well. So with that, let me stop and thank all the people that did uh, uh, all the work and, and contributed to this. So Alex Dunn is a grad student in my group who really set up all of Matt Bench and did a lot of work for the Matt Miner package. Uh, Patrick Huck is really the one in charge of MP Contrips. So if you do end up getting in touch about MP Contrips, you will definitely uh, get to know Patrick very well. Uh, and then Christy Pearson is the director of materials project. Uh, if you're interested in any of the slides they are already uploaded to our group website, uh, where you can click the slides button and it'll have all the slides. So with that, let me stop and take any questions that might have come up. Thank you very much, Anuba. I'm looking at the audience to see. Yeah, we have questions in the audience. Uh, very impressive developments. Uh, 
I was wondering, you mentioned steels, and uh, if I think of steels, then you can think in terms of compositions of alloys or compounds. But uh, if you also mentioned that you can evaluate the hardness and the elastic constants of steels, but the elastic constants of steels are typically also very much determined by uh, microscopic properties at grain boundaries, uh, precipitates, uh, and uh, all these things that people took hundreds of years to, de to develop. Is that in any way included in this, or are you only looking at uh, uh, alloys and compounds? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the steels have uh, many, many descriptors of, apart from the composition or crystal structure, et cetera, that, that, that completely change the, the mechanical properties of them. Um, so the, the particular steels data set in here was from Citrine Informatics, where they had a bunch of steel compositions. And I think that, uh, I don't remember all the details of that particular data set. I do know that it doesn't have anything like the microstructure size or anything like that. I just wanna see if I can bring that up really quickly and see exactly what's in there. Give me one second. Yeah, I think that data set just has yield strengths as a function of composition. Uh, and anything about like microstructure or grain boundaries or initial dislocations or something that affect the yield strength are not in there. So, you know, with machine learning, there's sometimes the case, right, that the input data doesn't have all the information that you need to actually really predict the output data. And I think the steels data set is one of those cases where it's really just the compositions that were measured along with um, the yield strengths and doesn't have the actual microstructure information included in the data set. And if I may, uh, a similar question relates to interfaces, because also for interfaces, it depends very much on uh, yeah, uh, the interface is usually even the, the device. So uh, is that in any way uh, to be included in, uh, in evaluating properties? Yeah, so right now it is just um, you know, bulk compounds and properties. So there aren't any interfaces in the current MapBench test set. Uh, I actually am not familiar with a good interface data set that we could use and incorporate as part of the MapBench um, test routine. You know, the machine learning methods typically work on bulk structures and aren't tested on interfaces. And I'm not sure what might be a good data set to use there. So if you had actually any suggestions on what might be a good interface uh, data set to use, uh, I, that definitely would be a, an important contribution to, to, to MapBench, but I just am unfamiliar with what would be a good data set there. So I'm going to give the word to, to, to Luca, but just, just one short comment on that. I mean, at one stage also, there is descriptors that need to def be defined for interfaces or for whatever other data set. So there is also a, a lot of work to be done there. So, uh, But I was going to bring the, the, the problem of the descriptors in our discussion afterwards. So I give the word to Luca. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. we can. Okay. So uh, hi, Anwar. Um, I have a, a bit of a technical question on, on this uh, uh, nested procedure in, uh, in uh, MathBench. Uh, so it is certainly uh, good for, for uh, benchmarking the algorithm, but I wonder which uh, model one is actually benchmarking because at every iteration, new test set, you will have a new model and then you average all different models. So the question is towards, okay, I, I done a benchmark and now I want to use a model to predict something for a new material, which one I should use or even worse. How do you know that one is not hyper optimizing on each test set? Because you know the data. This is the, 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 the case uh, every time you know everything about the data because they are completely public. And then you say, okay, my, my, my algorithm is performing very good on, on, on the test set, but you, you knew the test set. So you are free to, to oper hyper optimize on that. Sure. Um, okay, so let me take the first problem of, um, you know, now there's five different test sets and five different training sets. Uh, how do you know which one to use, et cetera? So there's, there's two things. There's, for the purposes of scoring the algorithm and, and getting an estimate of how good the algorithm is, and then there's finally the final algorithm that you use to make predictions for your application domain. Um, so the purpose of scoring the algorithm, you have five different scores, one for each of the different you know, nested cross validations, and then you take an average and a standard deviation. So the average score is what's reported on the website uh, of the five scores, and then the standard deviation you can use as like a bit of an error bar. Um, so that's that part of it, which is just scoring the algorithms. And then it's like, 
of the five models that you've trained, which one do you use on the, the final application? Uh, actually, none of the five. You would want to retrain your model on the entire data set, including the test set, uh, and then you actually um, use that for going forward with your with your uh, actual predictions. Uh, so, th so that would solve the problem of just having one one model for the for doing predictions. You just retrain it on the entire data set. Um, in in terms of hyper optimizing on the particular MatBench data set, um, it could potentially be a problem in the sense that. You could imagine writing an algorithm that just memorizes the entire MatBench data set and given the input, uh, just repeats what the output is, right? Because you know you have access to the test set. We didn't hold out any of the test set ourselves that, through an API or something that you can't access. So that that is a possibility. Um, what I would say is that in practice with some of these, uh, these other test sets, uh, other machine learning um, benchmarks, it hasn't been so much of a problem. There have been some papers actually that report that on some of these other machine learning uh, benchmarks that over time, some of the algorithms might be you know, somewhat tuned to, to these particular things in the test set. And if you start to you know, modify the test set a little bit, uh, the rankings of these things, well, the rankings actually stay pretty consistent, but the actual numbers uh, will actually change. So, you know, in theory, because the machine learning model is only being trained on the training parts of each of these sets, and it's only being tested on the testing part of these sets, uh, it shouldn't really be too much of a problem of this sort of a data leakage. But again, if you want it to be, uh, if, you, if you really wanted to hack it, you could actually just memorize the entire MapBench data set, write an algorithm that, that spits it back out at you, and then you would get a perfect score. Uh, and so again, in practice, I think it's been less of a concern over the last 10 years or so, as we see uh, on these other benchmarks, but it is something that can definitely creep in, especially as this thing uh, gets older and older and people hyper-optimize more and more. So I think it's just something that we have to be careful about. And maybe every couple of years, you know, introduce a new test set or something and just re-rank these things to make sure that things are staying consistent with similar but different test sets. Yeah, or as some kind of blind competition in which the, the final test set is held uh, secret, like, like this. Yeah, exactly. But every now and then. Because you can do only once for, for one test set, right? The moment it, 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 it is known, then you can do it uh, every time. And then... Exactly, yeah. But even the blind test sets, you know, you have to limit the number of times people can run the algorithm on the blind test set, right? Because otherwise people still find ways to hack the test set, where if you're allowed to evaluate your score. Then, then there'll score, be one shot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. On Kaggle is one shot. You, you, you are allowed to, to submit once and, 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 you, and you get your score yeah. when, you're, when you're sure. Yeah. Yeah, so they have like two blind test sets often, right? Where one you can kind of access a few times and then one that's like, okay, this is your yeah. final score and you don't get yeah. access to it. So yeah, well, you can also set up something like, yeah. Pub yep. Public, private and so on, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So these are all good suggestions. You know, I think we're still in the beginning stages of some of this, uh, but as we move forward and if we're seeing evidence of, you know, this sort of hacking, then I think we'll have to move to, you know, more strict protocols to make sure that people aren't actually designing the models specifically to the test set, but are actually solving the actual problem itself. Yeah, we have one question here. Uh, I have a question about uh, Matt Benchmark. I think for most machine learning package, there are validation inside the model. And uh, I'm wondering if there is a, a validation for the random forest. And uh, if there is, what's the scoring method for it? Yeah. So. To be honest, I'm not sure that I that I understood the, the question. So do you mean in terms of training the hyperparameters? Like how, what is the validation set used for training the hyperparameters of these models? Or for, yeah, is, is that what you're meaning? Like the internal hyperparameter training, what's the score that's used for that? Yeah, I, I mean, for the random forest, uh, there are hyperparameters. Uh, sometimes we can use grid search for the hyperparameters and uh, through the article, I didn't see you talk about the uh, great search of the hyperparameters for the random forest. Yeah, so the MapBench package itself just gives you a training set, and then you are free to do whatever you want to optimize your model with that training set. So you could split it up into a training and a validation set, uh, and then use the training set to pick your model and then use the validation set to update the hyperparameters, et cetera. So if you want to, you can follow that procedure where you use grid search, et cetera, to do it. And that's- I think she was referring to Automat Miner, if I'm not wrong. Oh, I see, okay. So, so, so how does Automat Miner do the actual search? Um, so Automat Miner takes your training set, 
it splits it into an internal training and validation set. And then it uses that, uh, uses a library called Teapot to actually do a search of the hyperparameters as well as the model itself. And then Teapot is the auto ML package that actually searches through everything using your, your training set. So it uses genetic algorithms. So rather than using a grid search, which is very expensive, and then you have to try every single combination, uh, it uses genetic algorithms to try and do it a little bit more efficiently and try to get to an optimum with less time. So um, with auto map miner, there's actually a setting that says, how long do I spend trying to optimize hyperparameters. Uh, and so you can spend just a little bit of time, in which case I'll do a little bit of a genetic algorithm, try different hyperparameter combinations, uh, and then give you the best result that it has. Uh, or you can say, spend 12 hours trying to look at hyperparameters, and then it will run this optimization process a bit longer and you know give you potentially a better model. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question or, or not. Uh, Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. OK. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aniba, for the talk. It's, it's just a follow up on uh, Lucas' comment. Maybe it's, uh, I was also thinking uh, about the fact that indeed the, the idea about what is the final model when you do this uh, benchmarking is like an important point because uh, I agree it's sometimes confusing with this nested uh, K fault. And so maybe I was just thinking that maybe adding like the, uh, the final model to MatBench uh, could be a nice thing to maybe uh, uh, see uh, in the future or anything. To, to make it available somehow, uh, but trained on the on the whole data then, and not just on the, the separate faults. Yeah, so, um, you know, currently the map bench was intended mainly to be more of just like, here's a ranking of the different algorithms. And if you wanna know how to, you know, do the entire thing, uh, if you want the model itself, go to like the model web page and, and get the thing. And then the map bench itself shows you the training on the different folds. Like it shows you the code for training on the different folds. Uh, and then also, yeah. So then you'd have to re, I guess you'd have to rerun that code mm -hmm. on the entire data set and then get your model out, right? Uh, so it wasn't a repository of the actual models themselves. Now there's uh, someone named Logan Ward at University of Chicago that was working on actually having a repository of machine learning models. And I'm blanking on what the name of this, <laughs> this resource was, but it was intended to be a repository of the model files themselves with all the hyperparameters all serialized and everything so that you could just load it uh, and then and use it right away. Um, so what I think we would wanna do is to try and maybe work with them to, because they already have set up a repository of different machine learning models. Uh, let me see if I can find it really quickly with, uh, and put it in the chat. Um, a DL Hub, yeah, someone put it in the chat already. DL Hub is the name of what they've been working on. Uh, so maybe what we can do is in that bench, just put a link to DL Hub where you can download the final model files and then just be able to use it out of the box. Uh, sorry, Luca, if that was also what you were referring to, I just didn't understand, but I think maybe this clarifies yeah. a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other questions here in the audience. I don't see any in the online. So maybe we can move. Yeah, first, let's thank Janubav again for the very nice talk and the, the answers.